Okay. Give it a second. I'm just go and redirect. I see us. All right. We're on. I see us. You're on. On. You all right? We are on. We're good. So, okay. happy Tuesday, everybody who's tuning in. Um, we're actually really excited to have Dr. Boris Weissman with us today. Now, Boris has been a friend of ours for, well, he's been a friend of mine for what, over 20 years now? Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a long time. So uh, Boris and his family are actually very, very long time members of the arena fitness community. One of the very first uh, members of the arena fitness yeah. community. So. He and his family have been with us for, for many years. Uh, more importantly, he's, he's been a great friend for a, a long, long time. I was trying to think back to when we first met, I was trying to remember if you were going through medical I school. I think I was, uh, school or? well, if I was in LA, I, I was done with med school and probably starting residency. Yeah, because this was, it was like 2000, I want to say. Well, if it's that long, maybe I maybe I was doing the end of yeah, or maybe two thousand and one. I think you were just yeah, coming out, like and you were actually looking for your yeah. for your residency at that point. Anyway, it's Someone been a long time since that time. Um, <clears throat> he has a uh, family practice in Woodland Hills, and really comes from a family of doctors. Both of his yeah, parents. it is a family practice. It it, really, it literally is a family practice. Uh, both both parents are doctors. Uh, brother Joey is is a doctor as well, and uh, so you know, oftentimes when we have questions that go beyond health and wellness and kind of into the medical realm, uh, Doctor Weissman uh, is uh, is is kind of our go to guy, and he's the he's the person that we that we grab on to first to get some some good medical advice and, and information. Um, first it's of all, mediocre just, advice. You know what? But effective. You know, we'll sometimes good enough is good enough. You know what I mean? Um, so thank you, first of all, for, for taking time to, to hang out with us today. I know you've been slammed lately. And that's kind of my, my first question is, how, how has your life changed in the last several weeks, especially since the stay-at-home orders came through? Are you still primarily managing your practice? Or are you spending time in the hospitals? Are you doing both? Give us a little bit of background about how your yeah, life has changed. I think all of us sort of remember when the shift happened, when the change happened. We were actually, um, the family had, uh, had plans to go to spring training um, on Friday the 13th. Um, and it was, it was the week that everything shut down. So went from thinking I had you know, uh, a few days off to, you know, all hell broke loose, but that was sort of the case with a lot of people. Um, and what's happened. So I work with the other doctor, as you, as you sort of mentioned in the, in the practice is my mom and she's over 65. So the first thing we decided is everyone's going to be, we're going to try to service everyone as much as possible through, you know, telephone visits or video conferencing, zoom, FaceTime, uh, but there are certain things that you still have to see people for. For her, she's not seeing anybody for any reason, period. She's only doing telephone visits. So any face-to-face -face contact um, sort of fell on me. So most of our day, we still look at our schedule. There's a bunch of people on the schedule, but we're doing FaceTime calls um, and trying to manage that way. For people that need to be seen, we'll do everything possible by phone. And then just for the visit part, they will drive to the office, come to the parking lot. And for simple things like, you know, sometimes you just need to look in somebody's ear. I will come out, you know, appropriately protected and look in your ear while you're in your car in the parking lot. And so that you're really trying to kind of limit that to critical right. issues so one, that. Yeah, 100. There is no, no reason whatsoever for people to be sitting in a doctor's office waiting room. So we've eliminated that altogether. No matter what's happening, what you're, you've come to the office for, uh, let's say a blood test or something along those lines, which we're still doing few and far between, 
uh, someone will come out and get you and bring you directly into the room that we're using. And that room gets disinfected before and after. Everyone's wearing masks. Everyone's got their protective gear. Give us, give us an idea of when you go out to, to meet a, a patient in, you know, outside or on the rare occasion, hopefully it's rare, that you're actually coming face to face with, with patients. Uh, hopefully it's rare because they don't need anything and also because you guys are being as safe as possible. But give us an idea of what that protective gear, what that protective... Uh, yeah, so it sort of looks a little bit different depending on what we're doing. So especially early on, we were testing a lot of people. We were one of the few offices that had nasal swabs. Um, how, I, I don't know. We, we had them, we asked for them early, we got them early. At one point, I know we had more swabs than Kaiser, which is crazy because we're just, you know, a mom and pop shop. So uh, if people are coming by to get tested, I will meet them in the parking lot in what looks like a spacesuit. I have a full yellow protective plastic jumpsuit. Um, gloves, of course, N95 mask, goggles, and a head covering. And that's just to come to your car, briefly swab you with the nasal swab and come back in. But a lot of times the nasal swabs, they go deep enough, they make you cough or sneeze. So even though it's in your car, we want that extra level of protection. For people that are coming in masked for something else. Let's say we're doing a, a blood test for them. They have a mask. We have an N95 mask. We're probably not putting on the same orange jumpsuit because uh, less respiratory droplets, um, that sort of thing. Hospital is a whole nother level. We do have patients in the hospital with COVID. Um, and uh, that always, that definitely feels a little bit more dicey. So before you answer that, my question um, on that front is, how much of your time are you still kind of focusing on managing your private practice versus the time that you're spending in the hospitals? So typically, you know, my mother and I would split hospital call. And in a private practice, we maybe had one or two people in the hospital. You drive to the hospital, it takes maybe 20 minutes to see them. Everything's pretty fast. Now she's not seeing any people in the hospital. She's not stepping foot in the hospital. So it's just me. And now, even for the simplest of simple things in the hospital, it is a whole ordeal. Yeah. And you, you outlined that in a post on Facebook, which yeah. I thought was amazing. Can you break that series of steps down for us so that, so that we can get a, a, a clear view of what you have to go through in order to see a patient at the hospital? Yeah, so first of all, scrubs only, uh, because even though the virus doesn't live well on surfaces, it really doesn't live well on cloth type surfaces. It lives a little bit better on plastics and metals. So scrubs don't have any buttons. They don't have any zippers. There's no belt. So you start your day with that. Uh, well, that's really quick. I don't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, you know, just to dispel a myth. I was hearing different reports where it's like it lives on your can live on your clothes for like up to three to seven days or something. Is that a, a falsehood? So, yeah, it, it's a little bit of a misnomer. So virus particles can live on certain surfaces for days, but a virus still needs an this virus needs an entry point. So let's say I, I have a thousand viral particles on my iPad because I sneezed on it. I still need to touch that iPad. So if I touch it with my hand, not all thousand particles are, are then transferred to my hand. Let's say a hundred are. It's, I'm still not infected. It needs to get through an entry point, mouth, nose, eyes. So if I go and wash my hands, I'm good. That's it. I've now eliminated all those particles. But even if I take that, those hundred that made it to my hands and I touch my face, not all of them are transferred in. Maybe 10, 15, 20 are transferred in. The fewer viral particles, the less likely you are to get an infection, the less likely you are to get a severe infection. And it doesn't live as long on things like cloth and cardboard as it does on things like plastic. Uh, so yeah, when you take in your mail, 
or you're getting a package and you touch those things, as long as you wash your hands thoroughly afterwards, you're in good shape. Okay. But if you're stupid and you don't know, was that package, does it have a little passive virus or did someone sneeze directly on it? So you're, you're acting as if the thing that you're getting is from the stupidest, most irresponsible person ever. And that way you're being extra cautious. And then, and, and then you can get back to the, um, to the protective gear uh, that we were talking about, but what about the load, like the viral load? Is there, I've heard some talk about the extent to which you may be infected or impacted may de be dependent upon the size of the viral load that you receive. Do we have any firm uh, information yeah, about that? Listen, we don't have any firm data on anything, but uh, there certainly is, there seems to be data pointing to the fact that the higher the viral load, the more likely you are to get infected and the more likely you are to get a severe infection. So one of the big thing about when you have new novel viruses like this novel coronavirus is your body has no idea it's an invader for a period of time. So it doesn't react to it right away. So if you imagine if I get thousands and thousands and millions of virus particles, like if I'm an anesthesiologist like my brother, looking directly into a patient's mouth that is very sick and I'm intubating them, those people are getting very ill. Whereas if I'm going to the car and I've got all my gear on and the patient has a mask on and I have a brief exposure to them and they're in the outdoors. Even if there is virus there for me to get, there's very little. Okay. So that's why we are seeing a lot of the, the first responders, the healthcare workers, people in sort of a boxed in area getting the worst infections. Because of the concentration of the viral load. Yeah, and, and the way they're treating people in the hospital wisely is they're in isolation. They're in a room that is completely sealed off to make sure that virus doesn't get out. To the same degree though, people that have to go into that room, I, I think of it like a, a hot box. <laughs> it's a virus hot box that yeah. you're walking into. So it'd be yeah. kind of like the difference, the difference of um, you know, walking by somebody who's smoking or going into a, a, a smoky bar. Yeah, yeah. If you've ever been to some of the airports in Europe, they will have a little box in the middle of the airport where people can smoke and it's closed. And it's clear, or it's supposed to be, but it's not. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it feels like going into those rooms. And that's why you try to take as many precautions as possible. Makes sense. So, so now continue on with your, dis with your description. So you, of, you, of you, drive to the, you drive to the hospital, you're in scrubs, uh, you get out of your car, you put on a pair of gloves, you put on your N95 mask, um, you walk into the hospital, they check your temperature as you come in. Uh, I'm not doing any elevators. I'm trying not to do it in closed spaces if possible. So we'll take the stairs up. If you've ever worn an N95 mask, you know, doing five or six flights of stairs and those things, you know, makes you feel a little, a little winded. Um, oh so you get up onto the floor and then not to bring any germs in, as soon as you get to the nursing station, you're gonna swap out your gloves you're going to wash your hands with soap and water. Um, and then uh, you're going to get ready to see the patient. So you put on a new set of gloves. If they have everything you need, you'll put on a new set of gloves, foot covers, a gown, uh, a new N95 mask that you're not going to leave there with, a mask over your N95 mask. And what they had at first in both Tarzan and West Hills was something called a papper. It looks like a, like a piece of scuba equipment. You're breathing your own air. Um, they don't have enough pappers because they require a disposable face shield and that's run out. So now we just have some sort of face shield plastic thing. It, you're not breathing your own air, but as close to it as possible. Then you got your, your head covering, you unzip the door, you go into the room, uh, you don't use your own stethoscope, which has its own nooks and crannies. They'll have a dedicated stethoscope there that you use. 
you see the patient as briefly as possible. You get out, you undress from all those things. Uh, anything that needs to be reused, you need to decontaminate after. Wipe down with some version of hospital <clears throat> Clorox wipes. Um, you throw away all your stuff, you wash up, you put on a new pair of gloves. Now you gotta, you gotta find a computer. If you're smart, you find one not on a nursing floor so that you're not sharing it. You go to that area, you wipe down the computer, you write the orders for the nurses, you write your note, you wipe it down again, you toss your gloves again, leave the hospital, you put on new gloves for the car, you get wherever you're gonna get. Uh, oh, and usually I will, uh, nowadays there's, there are no visitors, so the, the parking structures are pretty empty. I'll just strip down and, and throw my uh, scrubs into the trunk and, and put on a new pair of scrubs. So that's a very multi-stage complicated process obviously it's an it's an important one process person. what's that for one person one right person. so my question is um that turns a simple visit which used to take how long into a simple visit that takes into a complicated visit that takes how long yeah so probably you know forget about like driving to and from the hospital the actual visit from the moment you walked into the hospital to the moment you left was probably about you know 20 ish minutes for yeah. most people especially if it's not the first time you saw them, if it's follow-up and you're just sort of checking in. Um, now that, that that whole process is easily an hour plus, easily. Right, so it's- and you can see, if you work in the hospital full time, that's me to, to come right. and see one person. Right. There's no way an emergency room nurse can do that process between people that need her every 10 minutes. So that's why they're, they, there's some transfer. You're bringing some home. You're, you're touching something. You're breathing something. And that's why yeah. people are getting infected that have to stay in the ERs and the ICUs. Now, you said that if they have everything that you need, how, how are they doing? I mean, how are supplies holding up? Do they most, most of the time, do they have the equipment that you need? Or so, are you often going into these risky situations lacking some piece of protective gear. Yeah, so uh, without calling out certain hospitals, but uh, we have privileges and see patients of both Tarzana and West Hills. And the first week in West Hills, we had a COVID positive patient, um, you know, with big time breathing difficulties and got to the <clears> floor. And our first question you ask is, well, what do you guys have here? And uh, I was told, well, you know, we have N95 masks for you to wear inside the room if you want one. Hmm. Who wouldn't want one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, they said, well, you know, according to CDC guidelines, because that was at those, those days when they said, well, if you don't have a mask, you can wear bandanas or whatever you can get away with. <clears throat> um, but that's, this was to go and physically see a person in a 10 by 10 room. Um, they were recommending to their nursing staff that if they weren't doing a respiratory treatment, they didn't have to wear an N95. Now, how early on was this? This is very early. Um, did they did they change know, mid, that policy mid to at late some point? March. Yeah, I mean, I I can't tell you how upset the doctors and the nurses were. I mean, the correct answer is if if you walk into a room with an N95 patient and you're not uh, sorry with a COVID patient and you're not wearing an N95 mask, you should be fired. Right. You're going to transfer, you're going to get it, you're going to transfer it. So it, the policies were basically based on what they had. They just didn't have enough masks at that point. Yeah. So now, you know, all the local hospitals seem to have enough masks. They seem to have enough gowns, <clears throat> um, face shields. Yes. Uh, Pappers, no. Um, but it, it sort of ebbs and flows because these things are just, they're not meant to be reused. Even if you're wiping them down, they're not that sturdy. So there have been days when they say, well, here's a face mask, but it's got three or four cracks in it, or it's sort of falling off and you have to ad lib a little bit. I mean, you do what you have to do. Yeah. Wow. Um, um, this taking place this whole protocol of having i mean do you have any idea of 
what you think the future of just medical care is going to look like. Is this just this is what 2020 looks like? Uh, <clears throat> is there not enough information for you to actually make an assessment? And what are you guys doing on on your side of things in terms of planning out? Well, probably one of the biggest new things is the antibody testing that's come out in the last few days. Yeah. Um, sorry, one second. Uh, and there, there's two, there's one thing that's, that's readily available now, which is they're basically finger stick antibody tests to be done either at home or in doctor's offices. They kind of look like a pregnancy test. The answers are back in 20 minutes. If you show antibodies to that test, we're pretty confident that you have antibodies in whatever level of immunity that grants you. What we're seeing though is there are people that probably have antibodies that the test is not detecting it. So they're not super accurate. Right. Uh, we expect labs like Quest and other big labs to start doing blood draws for antibodies, which should be more effective because the methodology will be the same each time in the lab. Uh, next week, maybe, give or take. Once you know who's immune, that changes the paradigm a little bit. Right. You know, if I'm immune, do I need, I don't need to waste or spend as much protective equipment. Maybe if I'm immune, I still need to wash. I can still transfer things back and forth on my hands, on my feet, on my clothes. But maybe I can be the one checking people in. Right. without wearing a whole space suit. Um, and, and that sort of changed it because like I said, they are putting policy in place based on what they have. There's no point in putting a policy in place that everyone changes their N95 mask for each patient because you'll run out in the day. Yeah. It's got, right now they're, they're saying you get, in these local hospitals, you get one N95 mask a day. That's, that's crazy. And, and you're seeing, you're, you're seeing patients that have COVID, but are you primarily seeing, or are you exclusively seeing your private practice clients yeah. or are you seeing anybody yeah. outside of that? No, there, there are patients that, and the interesting thing is, is we forget that people, the hospitals are typically 80% full before coronavirus. Yeah. So uh, we had patients in the hospital two days ago that uh, had to have, their appendix out. Yeah. Guy that had a, a bad flare of his diabetes. Those things are still happening. Yeah. And one of the problems that, that we're seeing, the ERs are empty, not full, because people are not coming. And there is a big difference between social isolation, which we should be doing, and medical isolation. People with chest pain and abdominal pain and things that would get you to the ER need to go. Um, a good friend of mine, Dr. Snyder, who runs the ER Tarzana, is seeing a lot of people come in too late. Right. Okay. So that's a that's a great PSA. There's there's no there's no resuscitating them. They waited till the stroke has already happened, till the heart attack has killed them, and there there's nothing for the ER to do. So that's a really good PSA. Then um, the message to people is if they are experiencing symptoms that they would under non-coronavirus circumstances take themselves to the ER for, they should still take themselves to the ER. Yeah, and the ERs have different processes now. More than ever, you can call them and say, I am coming in or I'm bringing in my husband, wife, whoever with chest pain, how do I do it? Some of them will come out and get you from the car. People are having very, very limited contact. We had a, a person that had to get stitches. You can't do that through telemedicine. They went to the emergency room. She said the only person that came anywhere near her was the doctor. Nobody else within 15 feet. Okay, so so let the let the ER decide. In other words, yes. don't 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 doctor yourself if you're feeling life threatening or severe symptoms of any kind related to coronavirus or not. Attack. Yeah. So go, go into the ER. Yeah. Um, with the people that you're seeing, the, the patients, the COVID um, uh, patients that you're seeing, what are the, what's the range of severity that you're seeing? Are you seeing 
a high percentage of people who are highly afflicted? Are you seeing a mixture? Um, That's a great question. We're we're seeing, there are, we're sort of learning as we go, but one of the first really interesting pieces of information we had back a month ago <clears throat> is uh, we knew of a party where the person whose birthday party it was was infected and it was public knowledge that he was taken to the emergency room and went into the ICU at UCLA, was intubated. So a bunch of people from that party got tested either through us or through their own doctors. And of a hundred people, over 20 tested positive just from that one get together. Of that 20, there were people that had almost no symptoms, nothing. There were people that, like the birthday boy who ended up intubated in the hospital, they tended to be older, medical problems, uh, smokers, um, but there were only a few of those. Uh, The bulk of them were somewhere in the middle, ranging from I had a little bit of a cold for a day or two, to I was in my bed for a week with the most intense fever and muscle aches. But you you saw that of those 20-ish people, only a couple were severe. Um, And some of them, they wouldn't have even mentioned anything. Their their symptoms were so mild. And we know that they got it at the same time. So the same probably person. Are we... Uh, is there more clarity now around why, I mean, obviously the people who had pre-existing health conditions are, seem to be experiencing disproportionately yeah. extreme reactions, but then you, you will hear about, you know, the 45 year old marathon runner. Um, do we have any indication as to why there's such a disparity between people as far as the the range of of severity and how they're being affected. The the truth is, you know, it's not false information, but um, the by and large, your age and how healthy you are determines how well you do. Uh, The there's there's a hindsight data out of China and you know, you take some of that with a grain of salt, but yeah. of people that were tested and tested positive that were in the 80 plus group, about a third of them were being hospitalized. So very serious enough to be hospitalized, even there. Of the group, uh, for example, in the 20 to 30 year old range, 0.4%. Mm. Okay. And basically as you got older, your rates of serious infection and hospitalization went up. There's still the rare cases of younger people and there's, there's a couple of sad cases of, of little kids um, passing away from meningitis related um, complications today in the news. But for the most part, the younger and the more healthy you are, especially in terms of your heart and your lungs, the better you're doing. There's always the exception to the rule, but that's the rule. Okay, so we've, we've been hearing that pretty, yeah. consistently since the beginning of that. So that sounds like that is remaining the case. Um, locally, when we're taking a look at kind of like our local healthcare system, Los Angeles, but in particular, San Fernando Valley, how's the local health healthcare system managing the, the patient load right now? Yeah, I mean, it, again, it, a little bit of it is is determined by what is available and what's not available. I would say, you know, Kaiser, who's a big player here in the Valley, for the most part, if you're sick with what they suspect is coronavirus, or you're not that sick, um, by and large, they're not going to test you. They're going to tell you to sit at home and just bear down and hang out. Okay. That's That's pretty much what I'm getting. I'm I'm actually Kaiser, and that's pretty much what I'm getting from Kaiser is like, listen, if you're not, there's no need for you. You know, if you're not sick, you're not feeling the symptoms, you're good. Don't worry. You know? (laughs) Um, and it doesn't seem like they're too overwhelmed. So are you seeing- No, um, they're not overwhelmed. There's still a shortage of nasal swab tests. Um, And if Kaiser opened the door for everyone that had a little bit of body aches and fever, they would run out probably in a couple of days. Right, right. Are are you seeing a change kind of in the uh, 
the flow of cases? Um, is there an uptick? Is it seem to be heading trending downward? There's, there's definitely more people now that are asking for, do you have antibody tests? They want to know if what they, so they sat at home two weeks ago or three right. weeks ago or four weeks ago because there weren't tests to be had. And now they want to know, was that it? Do I have some level of safety to get out there? Um, yeah, but we're seeing things in pockets. Uh, I just spoke to someone today who's, who's coming by later to get tested and they had gone to a funeral and it turned out one of those people was sick. Now a bunch of people, anytime there's a meeting place, you get a little blip. Yeah, okay. And then overall, do we know what the data are pointing to at this point as far as uh, California or LA County in general, um, as far as the curve, the trajectory of this whole thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's still, it's hard to say because as more tests become available, your numbers go up. Uh, I would say it appears to us that it's sort of flattening out of how many people are infected. The real question, which is sort of hard to tell sometime from the news is not how many people are infected, how many people are hospitalized, how many people need a ventilator, how many people in the ICU. And for now, we're not at capacity, we're not near capacity. We've done a good job with that. People are staying in the hospital for a long time with coronavirus because there's essentially very limited options in terms of treatment. We basically give you oxygen, yeah. maybe through a ventilator and wait. So that's not a fast process, that's weeks. And that's why New York was behind the eight ball is you admit a person, they stay for two weeks. And during those two weeks, you're admitting more and more people, they're not leaving. Eventually you won't run out of room. Yeah, so there's we just a are at this there. point admitting, but at a similar rate to them discharging and there's room because we stopped doing elective surgeries. You know, grandma's not coming in for knee replacement this month. She's right. gonna have to wait. Um, so we're trying to make sure there's plenty of capacity. Cool. Um, so I got a quick question. Uh, Maddie's also asking, uh, I've got a kind of like a three part question. What are the availability of these antibody tests and where can people get them? And then kind of like a fast forward question. Do you see, let's assume like, you know, everybody gets these antibody tests. Do you, as a, do you see as a strategy is the medical system going to start to ask people that are immune to come in? Because we've heard about like the plasma and taking somebody that has had the, the coronavirus and taking out plasma and using it to cure other patients. Yeah, so we've that? already sure. seen people that have been confirmed as positive donating their plasma for some of that treatment. What we would love to get is, is a simpler treatment, right? Here's your pill you can take so that you don't get a serious infection. We're sort of, you know, we're still waiting for that. Um, the antibody finger stick test is widely available. There's no shortage of supplies because you just need essentially your blood and that little cartridge. Right. right. The problem with them is they're not super accurate. Got it. So, so if you get it, if you get a negative, uh, you get a result, negative, maybe you're negative, but yeah. you might, be positive and have antibodies and it's just not enough. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I stuck myself and tested myself. I didn't have any antibodies. I never was sick, so I didn't think I'd have antibodies. But uh, when the test blood test comes from Quest, I'll test again. That's a more reliable test. Um, and you said that, that I trust the methodology of a lab technician, even over myself, because this is not usually what we do. And each company is giving slightly different guidance on how to do the test. But uh, antibody tests will be available without shortage. Good. And um, where, do you, where do you think that you can get the antibody? Is that gonna be something that's gonna be- So, so like light? offices have them. Um, blood test is, going to be done through like a lab like quest you're going to go in they're going to draw your blood oh, nice. that's certainly the easiest way now it depends on the doctor's office did you buy the test did you think it was worthwhile to purchase 
So I've got like, I've got, I've got a bunch more questions, but we don't want to keep you here all day. So I want to ask you kind of one, which will be my final question anyway, (laughs) um, which is as a doctor, but also as a father and a husband, what sort of benchmarks do you feel need to be in place before you're going to feel safe with your family being reintegrated into the outside world? What yeah. needs to be, what needs to be there? Like what measurements, what benchmarks need to be in place uh, before you're going to feel safe with that? I, I think it's going to be hard to go back to regular life. I mean, uh, you know, if I, if I were to take my family out to see, let's say <clears throat> you guys, I would feel like, well, we have to have N95 masks and you have to have N95 masks, but are there N95 masks to be had for the general public? Not really. Um, or you're going to have to know who's immune. Or you're going to have to have an easily available and effective test, uh, sorry, treatment. So not that if I get it, I'm going to have to go and find somebody who had it with the same blood type as me. And there's not going to be that many of those people around. That's, that's not going to be treatment for a million people. Right. It has to be something easily available or a vaccine. Then we start getting back to normal. Right. So a vaccine is, is if I'm hearing correctly, somewhere between 12 and 18 months away. Takes a long time. You want to make sure just because a vaccine works doesn't mean it won't grow a third eye out of the side of your head after six months. You just don't want to approve it because it works against the virus. Right. So that's that's a pretty big time horizon. Having enough equipment or safety gear for all of us to be wearing on a daily basis reintegrated back into the normal flow of life seems unrealistic because we would need to have dozens and dozens of and dozens of these masks and such. So it really seems like it comes down to the antibodies tests and understanding who's infected and who's not. Yeah, does that seem like help a lot? Yeah. But I think as we sort of start taking some more calculated risks as we open up, it'll look a lot more like Asia looks where people are walking around with masks, not because they're sick, not because they think you're sick, they think you're healthy, they think they're healthy, but they're gonna at least have a level of protection and you know a level of distance. So when people start coming back to the gym and start going to get haircuts and things like that, people will still be at least somewhat covered up Okay, so so based on um, based on safety and health, and not on politics, um, what do you think is a reasonable timeline for us to begin like a phased reintegration into into normal life? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if phased with many steps, you know, baby steps starts in a few weeks. So everyone's going out with face coverings to the grocery store and keeping their distance, could they do that somewhere else? Are there other places where you can keep a little bit of distance with a face covering? I mean, maybe soon we're ready for that. There's certainly, does that mean that you'll be walking into a place to get a haircut and nobody's wearing a mask and you're standing and you're you know, breathing on each other for half an hour. I I doubt it. I doubt we'll be there anytime soon. But, uh, you know, it's interesting because I understand the civil liberties people that are saying, listen, I think I'm okay. I'm not afraid of this um, because I sort of find myself in that boat a little bit. I'm not afraid if I get it. The problem is, is that if, if healthy people get it, the ability to pass it on to unhealthy people, um, and older people, everybody has a parent, a grandparent, a neighbor that's, that's, uh, you know, won't do well if they get this. Yeah. So that always comes down to like that old question of, of, um, you know, the right of one person to swing his fist ends where the next person's nose begins, you know? So your right to go out into safety and, or into the public and enjoy that freedom could infringe upon somebody else's freedom because you could be passing on that that illness. Yeah. Uh, Joe, any final questions? No, man. Uh, just a big thank you from all of us. Just uh, Not at all. 
keep up the good work, man. And uh, stay safe, man. Send our love to uh, Joanne and the family and, and your mom and dad. We'll do. They say hello. And uh, I'm sure we'll get another arena workout in this week. At least they will. Yeah, you know, and you know what's great about this, Boris, is that, you know, we all hopefully want, hopefully none of us are spending too much time watching the news because it's just mostly anxiety producing more than anything. <laughs> but it's, it's nice to hear the perspective of somebody that you know and somebody that's actually a part of your community as opposed to what politicians are saying or what they're saying on the news because it's so convoluted and so politicized and it's highly charged and it's hard to know what to believe and what not to believe. So super, super cool to have you on today. We not really at all. Appreciate yeah, it. just one foot in front of the other. That's, I think that's what we're all doing. We're just trying to, to get through it. And, and one day we'll be looking back on, on these times and this year and go, I remember 2020. That was an interesting year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, right now, it, everything just sort of sucks, but uh, we'll, I think we'll be looking back, um, you know, with a little bit more fond memories 10 years from now. For sure. So every, hope everyone stays safe and uh, we'll all talk soon. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on, man. Right. We appreciate it. Bye, guys. See ya.